Welcome everybody. We're so happy you're here today. Thanks so much for joining us for this Challenges in Conserving Colorado's Native Bees webinar. And I'm Joyce Kennedy with People and Pollinators Action Network. Uh, we're so excited to have the amazing Dr. Adrian Carper with us. He brings incredible expertise and enthusiasm to this topic. Few things before uh, we get to Adrian. If you've been attending our webinars, you know that PPAN's work stretches from advocating for the protection of native pollinators to education and actions that promote sustainable land management practices, safeguard public health and preserve biodiversity. And we're, we continue to be so excited to see the strong interest in these issues uh, from all of you that have been attending our webinars. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about again before I pass it off to Adrian, we advocated for this year at the state capitol was a comprehensive pollinator and human health bill. And sadly, it died in a Senate committee hearing some weeks back. However, we have some breaking exciting news today that Senators Jaquez Lewis and Priola will soon introduce a new bill proposing a native pollinating insects protection study. And the Department of Natural Resources would manage that study if it were successful. So we're hopeful that this will garner even broader support this bill and have success at the Capitol. And the study really could work to help frame the state's work um, in how pollinators are supported in the coming years. It would document what we currently know about pollinator health and populations. What's the existing research, the gaps in our knowledge, and what do we need to know to improve pollinator health by making recommendations on how the state can best protect pollinators? So please reach out if you'd like to learn more about this or support the bill. Uh, we'd love to have lots of people advocating for it. Please keep your eyes out for our next webinar, which will take place in May in celebration of Endangered Species Week. We'll be doing that in partnership with Rocky Mountain Wild and the American Bird Conservancy. We also are planning to do a Denver City Nature Challenge hike uh, with DU biology professor, Julie Morris. So there'll be news about that in our next e-news as well. And always, if you've been enjoying our webinar series, please consider donating so that we can continue to do these free informative webinars. And you can do that on our web, uh, website at peopleandpollinators.org. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Adrian Carper. He's gonna tell you a little bit about himself, so I'm not gonna read his intro. So uh, Adrian, please take it from here. Okay, thanks so much, Joyce. Um, <clears throat> well, let me uh, first of all share screen here with everybody and make sure you can see that okay. Looks good. Awesome. Um, okay, well, um, thanks everybody for uh, showing up today to hear this talk. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard me talk before. I thought I would do something a little different today and toss in a whole bunch of little snippets from various talks that I've given um, and put it in terms of like, my perspective on challenges that we face in conserving Colorado's native bees. And so um, if you're not familiar with me, um, I'm a, a research associate in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and in the CU Museum of Natural History um, at the University of Colorado in Boulder. <clears throat> and I consider myself mostly a community ecologist, which means I study how humans impact biological communities and the communities that I choose to study are pollinators. And through my study and my research, I train a lot of other people in how to study pollinators. And so I have a lot of undergraduates and graduate students that um, not only work on my research, but I introduce these kind of subjects, topics and discussions in all the classes that I teach, like in ecology or in insect biology. But increasingly, I've found myself reaching out more to um, the broader community of people um, that are interested in pollinator conservation, including land managers and other researchers and amateur naturalists who are interested in um, native pollinator um, diversity, ecology, and natural history. 
Um, and this is really important because these bees not only are fascinating, but they're also ecologically extremely important. And um, they're also extremely diverse. And that diversity is what makes them so important because the ecosystem services that we rely on benefit from having abundant and diverse communities within it. And pollination is no different. And so just look at all the shapes and sizes and colors of these bees. All of these bees are relatively closely related. And while there are only seven or eight different species that are represented on this slide, there are a lot in the world as we're gonna see. And so I just wanted to jump right in with my perspective on conservation because a lot of people when they think about native bee conservation are really trying to tie it to their natural history, right? So if you can understand the biology of wild bees, then you can understand that they need nectar and pollen, right? Um, so in this uh, figure on the upper right, all bees, all of the species of bees in the world need nectar and pollen to rear their offspring on. So it's not just nectar from flowers, but also pollen. But natural history also includes the ecology of those bees, things like where they nest. Do they nest in the soil or in wood or in leaf matter? Um, and also things like how specialized are they in their floral preferences? So do they only feed on one type of flower or several type of flowers? But bee natural history also includes their diversity because they are extremely diverse. Um, how diverse? About 20,000 species have been described in the world. Um, about, uh, well, more than 4,000 of those are in North America and about a quarter of North America's diversity of bees are right here in Colorado. And we're learning more every year. Um, so we've added about 20 new state records or so in the past few years, just from some of the research that we're doing at CU. Um, and nearly half, well, actually over half of that diversity is right here in Boulder County, um, locally along our foothills. And so bees are extremely diverse. Um, compared to what most people are familiar with, honeybees, there's only about seven species of honeybee in the world, and only one here in Colorado, the Western or formerly European honeybee. And so while a lot of you guys, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir, you probably know a lot about bee biology and natural history already, but I bet what you know less of is the community context, which is really, really integral to conservation. And what I mean by community context is knowledge of the regional diversity of where you're at, so how many species occur in your area. Um, knowledge about where those species are found across their uh, uh, range. So species ranges are their distributions of where species are. Um, and then ultimately, historical data on how those ranges or distributions have changed. And so for insects in particular, we rarely ever use count data. We look at distributions in space and how those distributions change to make informed conservation um, decisions. And so we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about this. And one of the repeating themes you're gonna see in this talk is that to have that kind of community context requires a whole bunch of data and that building those kinds of distributions is exceptionally hard and one of the biggest limitations to our ability to conserve bees. And so what do I mean by community context? Here's an example of community context and why it's important for conservation. So when I first moved here in 2013, this article was published shortly afterwards um, from the Denver Post, the title, A Bell Golf Course Works to Save Bees. And this was the intro sentence. In an effort to help save the rusty patched bumblebee, this golf course started an apiary that housed 6,000 bees. Well, one, those are honeybees. It's not rusty patched bumblebees. An apiary is housing honeybees, right? Moreover, the rusty patch bumblebee has never occurred here in Colorado. And if we had the capacity to rear it, we wouldn't wanna bring it here, right? And so when you think about this ecologically, honeybees enjoy the largest distribution of any species uh, of bee in the world, right? And so there are seven species here. Most are limited to parts of Asia. Apis mellifera, the one that we rear in our backyards occurs all over the world. And just so that everybody knows, right? Why does it occur all over the world? Because we took it there, right? Um, it's not native. It's an agriculturally important species. Historically, it would have been limited to Europe and the Mediterranean region, maybe in North Africa, 
but we were really good at domesticating it and we really liked the products that we harvested from it. So we took it pretty much everywhere that we colonized when we traveled the globe, right? And so we're not worried about the honeybee based on its distribution. But when you look at the rusty patch bumblebee, it looks quite different. Um, so I'm gonna show you a lot of data in this talk. So hopefully I'll explain it very well. So this is paper, this is data from a paper, Cameron all 2007, that looked at what we can ascertain about the distributional change of bumblebee species in the US. And so on this little snippet of the map, um, basically the biggest thing you need to know is that all this dark fluted area is where they went to museums, they extracted the locality data from museum specimens, and they modeled the probability that you should expect to find that bee species there. So where it's really black or dark, there was a high probability that the rusty patch bumblebee occurred there historically. And then they took tons of recent surveys, like from the 2000s. So all these circles represent where researchers had gone out and conducted a survey. The size of the circle is how many bees they sampled. And then within that circle, the slice of orange represents the proportion of whatever species they're looking for. In this case, rusty patch bumblebee. So what you're looking for is where circles overlap with dark color and have orange. So how much orange do you see in this figure? Almost none, right? When this paper came out, the rusty patch bumblebee had receded some 99.9% .9 from its known historical distribution. Moreover, from those museum records, it appeared that most of that was just over the past couple of decades, right? That is what got this bee listed as the first federally endangered bee species in the continental USA, and that was in 2017. Um, we had another one listed just last August, Franklin's bumblebee. You know what the problem was? Um, it's probably already extinct. Um, so it hasn't been seen since about 2007. And we lack this kind of data to make the informed conservation decision that it needed to be listed as federally endangered because we didn't have this kind of comparative data. So we do have that data from this paper for lots of other species. So we don't have the rusty patch bumblebee, but we do have another equivalent. Um, Bombus occidentalis is a Western bumblebee species. And if you blow its distribution up here, you can kind of also ask those same kind of questions. Well, how much do we see those circles overlapping with dark color and orange slices? Well, there's a whole lot here on the West Coast that have almost no orange, right? The rusty patch bumblebee is declining in the westernmost parts of it, uh, not the rusty patch, I'm sorry, um, the western bumblebee is declining in the westernmost parts of its ranges. Where do we see the oranges? In high elevation places like here in Colorado and in Montana and Wyoming. Um, it's because this is a high elevation specialist and what we're seeing in this distribution is probably its response to a warming climate and that it's moving upwards in elevation. So places like here in the Front Range are really important for conserving this bee because we have high mountains where they're hanging on. But there's all kinds of other bees in there. Um, so what about Bombus terricola? This is the yellow banded bumblebee. And so what can we make from this distribution? Well, Again, just like the rusty patch bumblebee, it's from the Northeast. There's tons of surveys. Do we find it very much? Almost none. But what do you also notice? How many times have people looked for it where it used to occur? Almost none, right? So we can't, de we can't decipher from this figure whether or not this bee is in decline because we need more data where it used to historically occur to be able to decide if its distribution has indeed changed or not, right? And so, Recurring theme throughout this talk, we need more data to make informed conservation decisions. Okay, so that's kind of a set the stage for like um, how we think about bee conservation, right? We only have two endangered bee species in the continental United States. They're both bumblebees, but we know that there's a lot of threats to bees in general and to bee diversity. And you guys, like I said, already preaching to the choir, know a lot about this already. What's the uh, the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss in general. These aren't unique to bees, habitat loss and degradation, primarily from 
agricultural intensification, urbanization, pesticides, and other pollution. Um, the second one, which less people are familiar with, global warming. Global warming is, is, an, is an existential threat to all biodiversity, but it's especially problematic for high ele elevation bees like Bombus occidentalis, our Western bumblebee, because as it warms up, those cool environments that move up mountains are gonna get smaller and smaller and eventually disappear. Moreover, global warming, of course, exacerbates the problems, the issues surrounding habitat loss and degradation. It puts additional environmental stressors. All of those distributions that we saw, you know, the reason this is a northeastern bee is because it's restricted to cooler, wetter environments. And as climate change um, changes the environment, those bees will subsequently respond. And so never underestimate the impacts of, of, of global warming. But what I bet you most people don't think much about are managed pollinators. Um, and we know that managed pollinators do have impacts on our wild bees. And so we'll start off talking about those. And then we'll talk about this lack of data, why it's a conservation impediment and what we can do about it in the future. Okay, so let's get right into those managed pollinators. Um, so what do I mean by managed pollinators? I mean pollinators that are managed for human benefit, right? Um, classic example, honeybees. We took them everywhere we went because we wanted honeybee products, right? Um, and one of the most common things that I hear is, you know, oh, how are the bees doing, right? Because people have often heard about um, honeybee declines. And one of the things that I think a lot of people lack is context for how we interpret honeybee decline. And so one of the most common stats that you'll see is that we've lost 50% of our commercial honeybee hives since a peak in the 1940s. I bet most people here have probably heard that before, but they probably haven't stopped to think why was the peak in the 1940s? Remember, these things never used to be here, right? So it used to be zero. And so when you look at this figure that's often shown, here's the peak of abundance in the 1940s you'll notice that it's not a drastic decline in honeybees. It's not like when parasitic mites were introduced into the US, all honeybees went extinct, right? There's been a gradual decline and there's been ups and downs and bumps along the way in the road of this slow decline in the number of commercial honeybee hives in the US. But if you do a little digging, you can find a little more historical data. And so here's a figure that, that I found put together. Um, here's that same peak of abundance in the 1940s. And what you'll notice is that our contemporary numbers of honeybee hives is actually much more closely related to what our historical used to be. And that there was a rapid increase from the 1920s to the 1940s. So why do you think there was a huge increase in the number of honeybees in the 30s and 40s? Well, a little known fact is that honeybees were one of the biggest um, commodities used in the production of our industrial war machine during the um, World War, First and Second World Wars, to the point where um, wounded soldiers from World War I were actually encouraged to raise honeybees so that they can contribute to the ongoing war efforts in Europe all the way through World War II. Why are honeybees really important for war? One, because this is before we had synthetic waterproofers and beeswax was the number one most important honeybee product we harvested. We made candles from it. We made sunscreen from it. We used beeswax to waterproof everything from the outsides of our P-51 Mustangs to the jackets of every single bullet that went into the trenches in Europe, right? That's what kept all of those things functioning in the wet and uh, climates of Europe. Moreover, it was the only stabilizing ingredient for the most powerful explosive in the war, RDX, before TNT came along and replaced a lot of it. And so beeswax could stabilize this thing in the laboratory and in munitions where no other like wax could do it. Not only that, but during the war, sugar was rationed. We sent sugar across the seas to all of our troops. And so people were encouraged to raise honeybees to make honey so that they could have um, a substitute for sugar and give more sugar to the war effort, right? A whole bunch of demand. So much demand that by the end of the war, by 1949, there were so many honeybees and sugar was no longer rationed that there was a glut of honey on the market. Prices plummeted and honeybee growers went to the federal government and said, we need help. So the very first 
farm bill ever in 1949, subsidized honey at a fixed market price. And it's been there ever since, except for a short period in the early 90s. So very first agricultural subsidy, honey in the US. Um, not only that, when you start to look then across this, you'll see, okay, well, we had too many hives, people started declining, we didn't have the war going on, we developed artificial waterproofers, um, synthetic waterproofers. By the time you get to the 80s, this big drop that the USDA says was because of parasitic mites also corresponds with the honeybee making it to China and huge amounts of honey flooding the market in Asia because of the um, new market of honey production in Asia. Not only that, about the same time, the USDA decided to stop counting any hives that um, were from a producer that didn't make at least $1,000 in profit from their honey. And so they just quit counting a whole bunch of them. And so what I'm trying to get at is there's a whole lot of different stuff that's driving this story, right? And at the same point in time, it's not like we just quit eating sweet stuff, right? Um, the average consumption of total sweeteners on U on, in the US hasn't really changed a lot over the past 30 or 40 years, but what has changed is all the different alternatives that we have, right? And so when you look at things like corn, high fructose corn syrup has taken up a larger and larger proportion of the sweeteners that the average American eats. And what that means is that it's taken away this total caloric, caloric sweeteners includes honey from the proportion that used to be honey. Right? And so we're using less and less honeybee products, even though we're designing our agriculture more and more through the early part of the 20th century to feed those bees, right? And so all of this is pointing to the fact that honeybee populations that we see reflect economic decisions because they are an agricultural commodity, right? These aren't a natural phenomenon. They're something we manage and grow to get honeybee products and over the last half century, services, right? And so honeybees are extremely important in pollinating some crops, but not all. But the reality is when you look at contemporary data, our honeybees really aren't declining. And so when you look over the past few decades, new censuses from um, the USDA and uh, let's see, I forget what the other NHR data was right off the top of my head, all of this shows that hives, while they fluctuate a lot, are fairly stable. Um, this is the thousands of thousands of hives, so millions of hives in the US. Um, and when you look at the globe, honeybees have done nothing but increase. Um, and so um, we've basically increased um, by nearly 50% the number of hives over the past half century around the world because we've been expanding the distribution of where honeybees are. We've been breeding new stocks of honeybees that can survive in more extreme environments. There are people who are trying to breed honeybees here in the Rocky Mountains so that we can put them out on the mountains where we already know our vulnerable bumblebees are, right? And so again, you're kind of getting a setup for context here that a lot of us who are worried about bee decline, bee diversity, see honeybees not necessarily as a bad thing, but just as something that has grown and grown and taken up more of a share of this concern over bee decline to the point where we're literally swarming, pun intended, with honeybees, right? And that we need to stop and think about how we manage our honeybees because we know they have impacts on all of our wild bees. And it's not just honeybees, but honeybees for sure are the best example, right? And so the average um, honeybee hive has up to 80,000 bees in it. The average wild bee hive has one bee in it because they're solitary, right? They don't have huge colonial um, family units that all make tons and tons of larvae. They're solitary for the most part. Um, the Colorado Department of Agriculture here in Colorado, for example, estimates that there's about 40,000 commercial hives in Colorado. We have no clue how many backyard hives there are, but I would assume that there are thousands of backyard hives and even more hobbyist beekeepers, right? But what we do know is that they eat the exact same thing as our wild bees, nectar and pollen. And if you've ever known a honeybee grower, I'm pretty sure you would know that they think that pollen and nectar is limited in the environment. We have to move honeybees around even sometimes to find enough food to feed them. And that's with our management and care. And so if honeybees have a hard time finding enough food, do you think our wild bees have a hard time finding enough food? Probably. Moreover, each one of those honeybee hives 
consumes the same amount of pollen and nectar as about 100,000 of those solitary wild bees. So what that means is those 40,000 commercial hives alone in Colorado are eating the equivalent pollen and nectar of 4 billion native bees every single year here in Colorado. And that's a really, really conservative estimate of the impact of that competition because it's only commercial hives. And most commercial hives are on agricultural land where they're feeding on agricultural pollen. I don't have a huge problem with that. What I don't wanna see is hives going out on our natural spaces, which are trying to protect and conserve our wild bees, right? And so this is really pointing out that we have to start thinking about where and when and how we put out honeybees if we wanna get honeybee products. But they're not the only managed pollinators. And so a few years ago, I went out to Etsy and look, here you can buy Osmia Californica on Etsy. Do you necessarily think you could, we should have Osmia Californica here in Colorado on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains? You could buy it for $30 and put it in your backyard. Um, why might this be a problem, buying wild bees online? Well, because one, they come from somewhere. Um, and whenever you transfer things around, you risk transferring parasites, diseases, and pathogens. And we know from the literature that this is pretty frequent. Moreover, this kind of underlying thing that people don't think about is that selling and like commoditizing native bees comes with the problem that you now have the power of changing their population genetics, of introducing new diseases and parasites. And it comes with the problem of commodity driven issues like native bee rustling. And so in 2017, out on Bureau of Land Management land and Forest Service land, researchers started noticing that people were trapping wild bees to sell online, right? So not only are they facing threats of habitat loss and climate change, but now somebody figured out they can make money on them by catching them in the wild and selling them on Craigslist, right? And so um, the whole point of trying to conserve our bees and creating that habitat is to create an environment which can sustain the wild bees, right? So don't go out and buy them, make the habitat and they will find it, right? And of course, this kind of data isn't just new to you guys, it's new to a lot of managers. Um, and so a lot of people um, who, who make decisions about how we would otherwise manage pollinators don't know a whole lot about these kinds of interactions. Um, for one example, I got an email through PPAN a while back about should we allow from the Colorado Department of Agriculture the import of Bombus impatiens to Colorado. So Bombus impatiens is the eastern bumblebee. It only occurs in the eastern half of the country, and it has been grown now for a long time to pollinate tomatoes and greenhouses. And so if you want to grow tomatoes in Colorado, you've got a real problem because it wasn't allowed to import an eastern bee species to do its pollinating, and honeybees cannot pollinate tomatoes. Um, and so they reached out to us and said, oh, should we, be, should we allow this? It sounds like a good thing to pollinate greenhouse tomatoes. And so what did I do? I went to the literature, pulled up papers and say, we got good examples that this thing has been introduced in Washington, in Vancouver, British Columbia, in Oregon, and where it's been introduced, it's been linked to the spread of diseases which are leading to declines in Western bumblebee species. Given that data, would they say, of course we wouldn't do this, it's not worth the risk, right? So just connecting people to this kind of data is a really, really important thing um, to keep in mind. And of course, all of this is just for the most common and like well-known bees, honeybees and bumblebees. We put this slide up before just to show how morphologically diverse these closely related bee species are and that we've got a thousand different species here in Colorado. Should we be worried about them? So. It's a tough question um, because of that lack of data. Um, the best guess that we have for most of our native bees um, comes from um, this research paper, I'm gonna call it, um, from the Center for Biological Diversity that basically went through and compiled species lists for the entire US, including Hawaii, which has a, a very unique suite of, of native bee species. They looked at whether or not they're conservation statuses had been assessed, whether or not they had enough information um, to be able to assess the conservation of a bee. And of those nearly 4,400 species of bee, only about 7% have ever actually been studied to see whether or not they should be of conservation concern. Um, but of those that had been studied, nearly two thirds were deemed vulnerable to extinction. And so 
that's very worrisome, right? Um, and so we've got a lot more to figure out, but we should probably be worried. Um, so, okay. Set of the stage, um, a lot about bee ecology, diversity, honeybees, should we be worried? It's hard to say how worried we should be. We do have data from other regions that say that bees in Europe, for instance, are, are definitely in decline. We know that bumblebees here in the US have been declining. For all the other thousands of species of bee, the biggest impediment and threat to their diversity is that lack of data because we can't assign a conservation status or make a conservation um, um, decision without knowing what trends are going on with their distributions or populations. And so what about in Colorado? How do we know if we should be worried in Colorado? Well, in Colorado, we're lucky to be one of the only Western states with a statewide checklist. Um, the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History and Entomology section put out in 2011, the Bees of Colorado, which mapped out where we know species diversity in Colorado are. Nearly a thousand species in the state. What we're looking at though, are just counts of species per county. That doesn't tell you much about what you need to know for individual species, right? And what we need for that are data on distributions. And so what do I mean by distributions? Here's a stylized distribution map for Bombus occidentalis, that Western bumblebee species. And as you can see, it's pretty much restricted to the Western United States. There's two different shades of gray here because there's two different subspecies of Bombus occidentalis. And in Colorado, we have the similar map from the bumblebees of Colorado um, that shows the counties in which um, Bombus occidentalis has been found, but this is all county occurrence data. Where does all that data come from? So there's 2,620 individual observations that I could find that have ever been published on this bee in Colorado. And most of that data comes from the Global Biodiversity Inventorying Facility, GBIF. This is a data aggregator of scientific research, of museum collections, of all other stuff. It's all publicly available. Anybody can generate the figures I'm about to show you. The vast majority of this data though, comes from biological collections. What do I mean by biological collections? Ecologists, taxonomists, people like me who have been out inventorying bees for the past hundred years, conducting surveys, research studies, doing taxonomic revisions, all of those things, catch bees, they create museum specimens, they voucher those specimens, and then they put their data out there, either through publishing it or through uh, online databases. And those um, are quite rich. When you look at GBIF, so this is aggregating data just for Colorado for this species, um, we've got occurrences that go all the way back to 1898. Um, and so um, I'm trying to keep a look at the chat here. Sorry if I'm getting distracted. <laughs> Um, but what you'll notice is that these are the number of occurrence records. Most of the data on this species in Colorado comes from the 70s, when there was a researcher here collecting these bees as part of a big study. Do we know much about the distributions of bees through the past couple of decades? No. Do we know from this lack of data if it's because the bee doesn't exist anymore or if it's because no one surveyed? No, right? So we need to start to look out there more for this bee if we want to know whether or not it's in decline. Um, but the big point takeaway from all this is that basically these kind of collections, biological inventories, are where we know most about the distribution of this bee. 98% of all published records from this bee come from museums, basically. When you look at new tools like iNaturalist, which I, I bet a lot of people have heard about, or Bumblebee Watch, all of those records make up just one and a half percent of all the distributional knowledge of this bee, right? So a tiny fraction of what we know comes from these new kind of tools. Most of what we know comes about these historic collections. Why is that the case? Well, if you've ever used iNatural, if you ever tried to take a picture of a bumblebee and identify it, you know that it's hard for one. This species in particular can be extremely locally rare because it's uncommon, it can be really hard to identify, even a bumblebee, the biggest and easily, most easily identify of our bees. And there's just simply a lot of places where people haven't looked. So it makes sense that a lot of people have tagged this thing around Denver, Boulder, um, national forests, and yet there's tons of spaces out here where it likely occurs and no one is out there using iNaturalist to try to find it. 
And that's for a comparably wide ranging species, right? This is over the entire Western half of the United States. Compare that to something like our local, like um, poster conservation, you know, child, the macro Macrotera opuntiae. Um, it doesn't actually have a common name, but some people call it the sandstone mining bee. There are only 52 published occurrence records of this species in existence, right? And it comes from just a handful of populations here in Colorado and nowhere else, except for maybe in Wyoming now. Um, this bee is so, restricted in its distribution because it nests only in white sandstone that's just soft enough that it can dig its nest into and it only feeds from its specific epithet as you may have guessed on prickly pear opuntia right so it's extremely narrowly distributed given its combination of host plant and nest site and so we need to get out there and see where this bee is how it's doing and we need repeated measures of that to know if we should be concerned if it's declining or not and so a lot of data thrown at you. I thought I would contextualize this for you, right? You're all here because you know a lot about bees already, right? And yet what we know the most about um, is, is, is other stuff. And so this is all occurrence record data for Colorado. Nearly 16 million records of animals in Colorado in GBIF from studies of everything from birds to bats to ground beetles, right? 95% of all of the distributional knowledge of biodiversity of animals in Colorado is birds. That's what we know the most about. That's why we have such good conservation, like, um, uh, come on, I'm looking for assessments for birds. We know which ones are state threatened. We know which ones are federally endangered, right? Because we have so many good records about where they're supposed to be and what their populations are doing. When you look at insects, it's much less, 560,000. By the time you get to bees, 70,000 of those nearly 16 million uh, records are bees. What does that mean? Of all the distributional information we have of biodiversity in Colorado, bees make up less than half of 1% of all records, right? So we don't know much about what the distributions of those thousand species of bees we have in Colorado are, and we know even less about how they're changing in response to things we know have negative impacts on them, like habitat loss, climate change, and competition. So what do we do about it? Um, well, there's a lot we can do, right? Um, and so I'll just touch briefly on what all you guys are probably already doing. If habitat loss and degradation are one of the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss in general, and bees are no different. The best thing you can do is create and restore habitats to help mitigate that loss, right? And so lots of ways you can do that. Um, if you don't have a garden already, make one. If you have a garden and you haven't planted natives, do it. Say so you've already done all that. Engage with your community. There are tons of of uh, groups out there which are restoring habitat all across the state on both small and large scales, right? Um, take up a shovel, dig in some plants, um, make some fresh habitat. Connect with people within your community who are doing that, right? There are a lot of people out there that are thirsty, not only for knowledge, but ways to interact. And so lots of community organizers are out there. You may see some on this call or in your local newspaper. So um, they are great resources for how to find plants to plant, how to maintain a garden, um, to how to be a part of your community and affect change at a small scale. Um, uh, another big thing you can do, and this is why I'm giving this talk, is to increase the awareness about pollinators through outreach and education. Um, and so this is something that you just coming to this talk are already having an impact because I bet you're going to have learned one thing from this talk. It'll probably be that honeybees were important for the war, <laughs> but you'll share it with somebody else and it will change their perspective, right? And so how can you do that? Well, educating yourself is number one. Two, go to places where you can interact with other people. And so again, preaching to the choir, uh, a plug for our 2022 Colorado Pollinator Summit. It'll be on a Wednesday this year, Wednesday, November 9th. 2022 and it'll be in person at the Denver Botanic Garden so come if you want to um, you'll learn a whole lot of uh, stuff you'll find lots of new opportunities to engage with other people who are interested about pollinators and their conservation 
Um, you'll also hear from a lot more researchers. I, as being a part of PPAN and the Colorado Pollinator Network and the summit over the past few years, feel it's my responsibility as a researcher to bring us to the table because we're the ones that are most knowledgeable about pollinators and we should be out there talking about from our perspective what we need to do to affect their conservation, right? And so hopefully we'll continue that tradition in the future. And then ultimately, of course, what I talked mostly about in this is about how our knowledge is one of our big hindrances. You can help build knowledge about pollinators, um, which is really key to understanding how much they are at risk. I think it's a pretty safe assumption that all biodiversity on our planet right now is at risk. What matters is the degree that they are at risk, right? And that's what we really don't know for most of our species of pollinators. And so we're doing some in the museum already. Um, I got an NSF grant last fall that's called Big B, which is digitizing our historic museum collections. We've only got um, a couple of dozen thousand records up on GBIF from our bees, but we have many more within our collection. And so our grant right now is to basically database and image our historical collection in this U Museum. So we're going to be basically getting the data off about 60,000 historical specimens going back to probably the early 1900s um, so that we can add that data to GBIF and use it to see how distributions of our bees have changed. We're going beyond just getting the data by measuring a lot of traits on those species so that we can look for mechanisms that could be driving community response. Are small bees, for instance, more susceptible to environmental change than big bees because they can't fly as far? And we're doing this, hopefully, by engaging the public in research through community science, primarily using Notes for Nature. So some of you may have heard about this program before. Um, and so basically, um, Notes for Nature is a place for um, researchers to go to who can use the community of engaged citizens to collect data for them. In our case, we need to get the data off of, you know, this label from 1936 that was typed on a typewriter into Excel, basically, into a format that we can analyze. And that's extremely time consuming and problematic. Not all of these things are typed. We have cursive labels from the 19, like 10 teens and 20s, which are extremely difficult to read. And so we basically will be taking photos of all of these specimens, uploading them to Notes for Nature and organizing over the next few months expeditions and then recruiting people like from here who would be willing to sit down at your computer, pull up this photograph and type in Moraine Science Lodge, Boulder, Colorado, 1936 by Helen Rodeck, right? This thing was determined by one of our curators, Earl Lanham in 1939, but all of that data is on this paper and nowhere else. If this specimen were to catch on fire in a wildfire, all of the distributional knowledge associated with it would be gone until we get it digitized. Um, and so it's a huge goal to get this kind of data um, um, into some kind of format we can use. But we're going to go farther than just looking at 1930s um, handwriting by also using those community scientists to measure morphological traits of these historic specimens. And then so we know, for instance, that bee body size is an important trait in how they can deal with agriculture, with urbanization, because if you're a bigger bee, you can fly farther and you can find resources that are farther abroad, right? And so we also know that bees have changed body size in response to things like global climate change. And so the more measurements we can get on these things, the more kind of mechanistic insight we can um, uh, attain into how our communities are changing. So you'll definitely hear more about that over the coming months. As part of that project, we're also doing a whole bunch of other stuff, including um, taking lots of cool pictures of bees, like the, the butt of this little bee here, which I won't go into. And we're also 3D modeling all of the species that we have in the US because it's really hard for the average person to comprehend the scale of the problem of biodiversity because it's so abstract. You can't show somebody a two millimeter long bee on a pen and really have them appreciate you know, what it is, what it looks like, what role it plays in ecology. Um, but through taking great pictures of it, through modeling it, not only can we help researchers um, better improve our systematics and taxonomy, we can also create tons of useful outreach materials to engage people and make all those things publicly available. 
And then finally, the last thing I'm going to talk about is something that's just cooking on the books right now. We're hoping to get this thing up and running over the next year or two is what I'm going to be calling the Colorado Bee Atlas. And so if you were at the Pollinator Summit last year, or if you've uh, been a part of, uh, uh, of these efforts, you've known that we've wanted to get um, a community science driven project looking at distributions of bees in Colorado going for some time. And the Colorado Bee Atlas will basically be a big collaborative project which will use you guys and other people within the community as well as trained um, researchers to build knowledge about Colorado's here, uh, pollinators here in Colorado and to ultimately determine which one of those are at risk and what we can do about it. And so this will be a huge collaborative project. It's gonna build off existing frameworks, probably most likely off the Oregon Master Melatologist Program, which uses a combination of uh, both training volunteers to go out and collect specimens, which they would bring to the CU Museum of Natural History, but also by coordinating organized efforts to go out and collect using iNaturalists. So something like our bumblebees can be fairly well determined using iNaturalist if we have good photos. What we need is for people to say, oh, no one's looked very much down here in Gunnison National Forest for, for Bombus occidentalis. This is actually all bumblebees for all of Colorado. We need to organize a, a collecting effort out there to use iNaturalist. You could even do this in Rocky Mountain National Park, right? There's no reason you can't go up there with your cell phone and if you see a bee, take a picture of it. What we need is a coordinated effort to do it in a systematic fashion so that we can have comparable data through time and across space. And that's what that project will mostly focus on. So I know I've thrown a whole bunch of information at you guys. Um, hopefully it was somewhat coherent, but I get really passionate about pollinators and bees in particular because they're so diverse, they're so fascinating, they're so important and they're so beautiful, right? And so these guys out here are flying right now, Osmia riboflorus. This is a strikingly beautiful alternative to Osmia lignaria that's native here to the front range. So if you look out in your bee blocks or in your backyard, look for some shiny blue bees out there and hopefully you can appreciate them too. So um, I know I probably went pretty long, but if anybody got any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. That was wonderful, Adrian. Thank you so much. You did pack, pack in a ton of information. <laughs> Sorry. And I'm I sure we all do. learned something new. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so maybe you've been looking at some of the questions or I can read them out to you. If, uh, yeah. yeah. If you've got some burning questions, I'd say go for it. Yeah, I'm going to go try to start from the beginning. We'll try to fire them off as quickly as we can. Uh, somebody was asking about um, getting native mason bees from Washington that were supposedly harvested in Colorado. Does that, um, I don't know if they were just stating a fact or asking a question about that, but what do you think? Yeah, so I mean, again, um, I would argue that the whole point of creating habitat is to help wild bees. And so, you know, we saw this a lot with the Bees Needs Project, if anybody was a part of it. We'd give them a nest block and they'd put it in their backyard and they wouldn't get any bees. And they would be very sad, right? Just like if you put a bluebird box up and you don't get any bluebirds nesting at it. What does it tell me? Your backyard's probably not a good place for bees, right? Either what you do in your backyard is not the only thing that impacts it. It's what all your neighbors do, where you're found. And so, you know, you need to be creating an environment that one can sustain what you want there. And so buying bees and putting out in your backyard is no guarantee that they'll survive because if you don't get any wild ones there, there could be something wrong. Two, if you buy bees online and put out, you're just putting out competing managed pollinators for the wild ones. So buying Osmia lignaria online is buying managed pollinators and it's not wild anymore. They have been cultivated, they have been bred so that we can effectively rear them like on a sustained basis. And they no longer have the exact same traits. They're, the timing that they emerge could be wrong. Their uh, host that they feed on could be slightly different. And so I highly encourage people to focus on creating habitat that can sustain like native Osmia lignaria in your area already. And then if you put that habitat out there, they'll come to and find it. So I highly recommend not buying any bees if possible. <laughs> If you, you know, the only difference could be if you have an orchard or something like that, and you're having a failure of fruit set because you don't have enough pollination, 
that's the main reason we have honeybees now, right? Is because we grow our crops in such densities that we have truck in bees to pollinate them. So, you know, by all means, if you're looking to start up as an alternative to honeybees, something like Osmia lignarian and orchard, that could be a, a, a part of a sustainable program you have on your farm. But highly recommend you try and foster your wild bees instead of introducing managed. Great, thanks. And a bunch of questions about bee houses. I, I know I've been doing a bunch of reading about it to try to get a balanced answer to this question. What's your take? I think it could be valuable almost to do a whole nother webinar on them because they're, <laughs> they've become so popular and we want to be able to provide the best information we can. Yeah. I mean, you know, so bee houses, just like bird houses, are only as good as their design. So if you make a bad birdhouse, then it'll get predated by snakes or raccoons or starlings or some other kind of bird, right? Same thing with a bee house. Um, it needs to be appropriate to the bees that would be nesting in it. And so for us, the biggest thing that we see is that people make too short of nests and they don't think about things that could parasitize the bees within it. And so bees need five to six inch deep like cavities, most of our cavity nesting bees. And so a lot of the small ones you see in the store are more like three or four. That can actually have negative impacts because it skews sex ratios. Females will lay males instead of female eggs. Um, so if you go to the Bees Needs website, you'll see some recommendations. And there's some other good sites out there that have recommendations on nest block design. I think a lot of the concern that people have is about how they manage them if they decide to put them out. And there were some papers that came out a, a couple of years ago that were talking about negative impacts on them. One, that bee blocks had a lot of parasites, they had a lot of parasitic bees, and that over time, you tended to get more parasites and more non-native bee species. And the one thing that I like to point out is that those papers harvested bee blocks, right? So they put bee blocks out, they let bees nest in them, and then they took them into the lab to see what was in them right? So they killed everything that was in them. Then they put a new bee block out, did the same thing the next year, they pulled them in. And so that's actually a harvest. And it makes sense that if you're taking a bee block in and out like that, you're going to be basically promoting the fastest reproducing like species within a community, which are non-native things like alfalfa leafcutter bee. What we've seen in the bees needs is the longer you leave a single nest block out, the more native bees you get. And as for parasites, I argue that parasites are extremely important, right? Because about a third of our bee diversity are parasitic species that parasitize cavity nesting or ground nesting bees. And so if you want parasitic bee species, you need lots of cavity and ground nesting bees. Not only that, parasites are extremely ecologically important because they keep a regulatory pressure on the community. They stop any one species from becoming too dominant, right? So they regulate diversity. And so I don't necessarily think um, parasites are a bad thing. What I recommend, put a bee block out there that's well designed, leave it for a few years, and then you retire your block, right? So you get a new one, you put it up, you put the old one on the ground, and when they leave, they'll colonize your new block and you never have to worry about things getting too moldy, too skunky, or too full of parasites. Sorry, that was probably a whole lot into a into a question, but there's a lot to it, like you said. Right, but you put a lot into a short time, so thank you. Uh, a question about the range of native bees and how do you actually conduct a survey when their ranges are so small that you're not counting the same bee over and over, but kind of the range of native bees. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a that's a great methodological question. You know, most of our bees, are, you know, the good thing is that bees are central place foragers. So they have a nest in the ground or a nest in a tree and they fly maybe two or 300 yards from that to collect pollen and nectar. Unless you're a honeybee, of course, which can fly, you know, five, 10 miles to collect pollen and nectar, right? Um, and so most of our native bees are really restricted. So if you go on a hike, um, if you do a three or four mile hike, you're probably never going to encounter the exact same bee because they go out, they collect nectar and pollen, and then they take it straight back to their nest. And so that's one of the good things uh, uh, about surveying. Um, and the other thing that I like to say is that that's for like a little habitat, like in your neighborhood or on a hike. But when I refer to ranges, I usually think about the distribution. So where do they occur across the landscape, right? And that is what's really hard because 
without surveys that are systematically put across all of Colorado, you don't know if a huge gap is because no one hasn't looked there or if because the bee doesn't occur there. That's the importance of something like what we're gonna be proposing to do for the Colorado Bee Atlas is to systematically put points on a map for people to go out and look. And that way we really can fill in some of those distributional gaps in our knowledge. Great. We have about three minutes left. We're not gonna to get to all the questions. Uh, question though about neonics, is there a greater impact to honeybees versus natives? Any comparison of that issue? Yeah, so, you know, honeybees are the most studied. Um, basically, you know, neonicthenoids and, and other, you know, basically pesticides in general are mostly studied in a honeybee model system. And only recently have people been including bumblebees and to a lesser extent, uh, mason bees in some of those studies. And so we really have almost no idea what the physiological effects of most pesticides are on all of our wild bees. But if they impact like honeybees, the um, basically the physiological mechanism is the exact same across species. What we do know, like from work that's been done in Eastern Colorado is that they're ubiquitous in wild bees. And so when people have gone out and surveyed wild bees, they find a whole suite of agrochemicals in them. Um, what we don't know is the impacts that they're having. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, scanning through here, lots of compliments. Again, thank you, Adrian. It's been wonderful. Uh, interest in the Native Bee Atlas. Since we aren't going to be able to answer all these questions, I think what Sabina, my colleague who's also on here today, and I will do is try to get some of these questions answered through some future e-news editions. I mean, I think that we can collect some technical expertise. And uh, if you guys have these questions, there's probably others that have them as well. So I think, um, let's see, where can someone find uh, named specimens to confirm their IDs, their observations collections? Yeah, so, you know, um, the entomology like section in the Museum of Natural History is open. Like um, it's by appointment, but if you have a collection of bees and want to come and verify them, we'll take a look at them with you. Um, so um, you can um, email Virginia Scott, our collections manager, if you go to our website um, and arrange a time to come through. Um, you know, highly recommend if you're super passionate, you know, and I'll, I'll just put this out there in terms of like the Bee Atlas and in terms of um, Big Bee, my project. I'm gonna be reaching out to interested communities over the next year to look for people that are interested in engaging and being a part of those projects. And we'll probably be also having um, outreach talks through the Museum of Natural History um, to recruit volunteers for um, Big B in particular. So you're definitely gonna hear more from me in the, in the coming months about both of those projects. That's great. And it does seem like lots of people want to be involved and do some community science and volunteer. So again, we'll do our best to propose, um, post those opportunities. If Adrian has more, we can share those through our e-news as well. So again, uh, any final words for us, Adrian, today or um, as we well. sign out? Enjoy the nice weather. I've uh, I've already seen some bees flying around. I'm sure everybody else has too. So um, hope everybody has a chance to get out there and appreciate them. Okay. Thanks again, everyone, for attending today. So great to see so many folks here. See you next time.